to another episode of the 1970. My name is Ed and he is Mark. And today we're going to be talking about, yes, we have to do it. We're going to be talking about Neymar. Mark, you up for it? No, but I'll do it anyway. Yeah, so I've been spending all day responding to all of the Neymar stands on Twitter. So thankfully, I've got a few minutes. I can jump on the podcast with you. We could talk about our thoughts on Neymar. We could talk about the first match of the season. And we've got a couple of other topics we want to touch on. But before we get on to all of that, I want to just say that this podcast is being brought to you by the Big Heads Podcast Network. We're thrilled to join them. So go ahead and check out their other shows. We'll have more about uh, our partnership with them coming up soon and, and how you can listen to other shows. But we're thrilled to be on their podcast network. And so with that little bit of business out of the way, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. We're doing things a little bit different uh, here on the 1970. Typically, we'll do our five quick topics and then our main event. But the, the Neymar, I mean, we've got to talk about it. So we're, we're moving the main event up to the top. So, Mark, what is the latest on Neymar? I feel like I get this tweet all the time. So break it down for the people. Well, I'll start just by saying that this whole thing is a ginormous mess. And it is a Neymar-created mess that has dragged on now pretty much since the beginning of June, pretty much ever since Leonardo took over as sporting director. He took over on, I believe, the Friday, one of those fr- one of those early Fridays in June, and then pretty much the next Sunday, so two days later, the Lakeep story came out that Neymar wanted to leave. So pretty much from that point, which if I pull it up on the calendar, I might kind of be able to triangulate when that was that was somewhere around june 9th i think maybe even june 2nd it's been that early maybe even i would say probably june 9th so we are now into month three of neymar's transfer drama self-created um plausible deniability deal here so Pardon me if I seem a little bit uh, tired of it all after two months more. Of, it's exhausting. Well, it's exhausting. He is exhausting. <laughs> and it's like, it is like having a hot girlfriend that has all of these mental problems and all of this baggage. Or but boyfriend. Boyfriends have mental boyfriend, problems, too. Either way. Either way. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I, I'm just from my perspective. Um and you have this person that you're in a relationship with and they're and they they're beautiful, gorgeous, handsome, whatever. But you have to always rationalize why you're still with that person. And all of the things that that person does, you you have to twist them in your head to sort of be able to rationalize it and to keep moving forward and to support that person. Right now Neymar is in that situation with me. And for two years now, I have spent way more time in my adult life than I would like to mention talking about, watching, dealing with the Neymar situation. Because it's a situation all the time, whether it be injuries, whether it be him hitting a fan, whether it be him rolling on the floor after being tackled, whether it be him saying something on Twitter or posting a picture of himself or playing poker when he's watching the game, all this ridiculous stuff that as it goes forward, you don't, you, you defend it, you rationalize it. But then when you stand back and you look at the big mosaic that has just been painted, you kind of figure out what you've been doing for two years and it, it all that weight just sort of goes and it just puts on you and you're not and you're just not willing to sort of deal with it anymore. So I'm going to do my best here with all that out of the way to analyze this as best as I can. I know I'm talking a lot and I won't talk as much after this is done, but the deal here is really simple. When Neymar made the move, he expected things to go very differently than they did. And all of us in life expect things to go differently and expect them to usually go better than we uh, than they eventually turn out. 
And that's what he believed. He believed that he was going to come here. He was going to be the leader, the undisputed leader of the team. He was going to win PSG trophies. He was going to prove to everybody that he was a top flight, all time great soccer superstar. He was going to win the Champions League for PSG. He was going to win the World Cup for Brazil. He was going to win the Copa America for Brazil. And all these magical dreams that he had were going to come true. It has not worked out that way. His time has been plagued by injuries, and not just the two major ankle injuries, but a groin injuries and knee injuries. He has been in and out of the lineup. He hasn't ever really been able to find a groove playing for PSG. He very much feels like the way that the game is officiated in France, and we've said this before, so I don't necessarily find him to be wrong here. I think he believes that the game in France is officiated differently than it is in La Liga, and that's true. It's officiated a lot less stringently. Players who are very much less gifted than him are given an advantage against him that they are able to foul him repeatedly without any real consequence. And nobody really does anything about it. And more that he complains about it, the more the referees call the game against him. That's what he believes. And as I said, to a certain extent, he's correct. He is also in a position where he feels like he is isolated from his friend group. All of his friends speak Spanish. All of his friends speak Portuguese. They don't speak French. I don't think he has acclimated well to the French culture of Paris and of that locker room. And he was able to live with it when he had a player like Danny Alves, a friend around with him, when he had somebody like Maxwell, who was in his corner, and a, and a sporting director like Antero Henrique, who pretty much never said anything and allowed Neymar to do whatever the hell he wanted. I think that he has taken for granted the amount of time and attention that PSG have tried to give him. I think PSG have tried to make him feel at home. I think they've given him privileges that other players in that locker room do not get and that has rubbed a lot of the french players the wrong way who quite frankly don't give a damn who neymar is and believe that they're great players in their own right and that they should be treated no less than him all these things coming together and obviously the two ankle injuries the two foot injuries and ankle injuries that kept him out of the business end of the champions league and essentially cost PSG two round of 16s. Maybe not the Real Madrid one, but definitely the one last year against Manchester City. Then United. he gets suspe- suspended for three games in this year's Champions League for going on Instagram and complaining about the, U- the UEFA officials. Something that I probably would have done in a fit of anger, but it's probably something that shouldn't have been allowed to happen knowing how UEFA is. Mm. So put all this stuff together, Ed, and... Neymar, who has clearly faced this adversity, he stared it in the face and he has decided that he wants to run away and hide in in Spain, go back to the warm, loving embrace of Lionel Messi, sit at his bed, curl up, take whatever scraps he is willing to be fed, shut up, and try to rehabilitate his legacy, which I don't think he feels is where it should be. And quite frankly, it's not. Now, have I gotten anything wrong so far, Ed? Is there anything you'd like to add before I jump in again? No, I I would just echo that his legacy has been flushed down the toilet. I mean, you look at the time that he's been able to be on the pitch for PSG in a big game. He just hasn't been there. He's shown flashes. Um, I, I will kind of, if you're an NFL American football fan, I kind of liken his time with PSG to that of uh, Robert Griffin III at, at Washington Redskins, where he had a great rookie season, rookie of the year. 
than injuries. And he was always on social media saying something stupid and, and Redskins fans had to defend him. And he was, you know, the all in for week one, it just became a joke and injury. And and now he's a backup quarterback and just no one thinks about, I, I feel like Neymar is really headed down that path. And I'm not so sure going back to Barcelona is going to give him the kind of returns that he's looking for. I, I think that he's really damaged his legacy with the rolling around with the injuries and the not living up to the hype. And he, this is his last dish effort to try to get some of that back. And I'm not confident that he's going to be able to do it. Yeah. And we haven't gotten to a lot of it, but I, I kind of wanted to set all that groundwork to sort of give people an idea here of where the mindset is. And his mindset right now is this place is not good for me. I need to go back to where I'm comfortable, where all my friends are, where all my friends are telling me they want to go back to. Because if nothing else, Neymar is surrounded by enablers and his friends. And I put friends in quotation marks, friends who want stuff from him and his dad and let, let, let's just um, call let's just call it like it is. He's a scumbag, just like Barcelona, a bunch of scumbags, and they all want to be well, together. Well, well, and that's what well, it is. Well, he still might be our player in two weeks, so let's not completely burn the bridge. But oh, that no, has been he, it's not it's not it, it's not scumbag. It's a different word. He's entitled. Bar- people that go through that Barcelona system are more times than not they're entitled. Because they believe that they can either buy anything they want or they can win anything they want or they can manipulate their way to get anything they want. And this is where this now starts to focus. Neymar believed and his camp believed that all Neymar had to do to leave was just say that he wanted to leave to the sporting director and to the coach and to Nasser and to whoever. And they would just do it. I genuinely believe they thought that PSG would just bend over and take it and sell off Neymar and move on. But because he thinks he's bigger than the club, but even if he thinks that, there's the financial element where he can't just say that and, okay, here you go. He makes too much money. He's, his wages are too high. It's too complicated. There's really only one, maybe two buyers in the world. And he needs to understand that. that Both of those teams, I was reading a piece in The Athletic, that neither one of them – really need him when you look at their front lines he's really a surplus player and and at the price that psg are asking he it's silly for him to even think that he could just say that and you know in a week he'll he'll be gone they 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 know that they just don't care they it's that they know that they just don't care they don't think that psg is an institution that will stand its ground when pressured and that's what he's been trying to do behind the scenes. It's weren't they there? It, well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, weren't they there uh, at Barcelona when they tried to pull that crap with uh, Verratti and PSG stood their ground? Like, there's but it a- doesn't apply, but, the, but, but Ed, the rules don't apply to Neymar. Uh-huh. Neymar is different. He gets to play by his own rules. That's what he believes. That's what his camp believes. And the, the, the miscalculation here, the great miscalculation in all of this for Neymar and his camp was that he believed that his greatness would, uh, what's the word, would necessitate Barcelona to drop all of their plans and go get him. That's what he believed, that Barcelona would come in and do whatever it took. And it's very clear now that we're at August 14th when we're recording this mm-hmm. Barcelona really could get him or not. They're not in a hurry. They're in no rush. They're not coming to save Neymar. If it makes financial sense, they'll do it. Sure. He's a great player. <laughs> Messi wants him, So, you know, it'll make Messi happy, which just seems to be the only thing that Barcelona is there to do anymore. But, they don't understand that a hundred million plus two players that PSG don't want isn't good enough. And they're not negotiating like they really want him. They're negotiating like maybe we can get this guy for a bargain, but we're not going to, we're not going to empty the bank for him. And honestly, do Real Madrid want him? They just signed a guy that plays the same position. 
They're just Ooh, doing that to mess with Barcelona. I think that's what that. I don't think they're really interested in him. No, I don't think they are either. I think he overestimated his worth right now. It was a bad year. And we knew this from the beginning that if he were to try to pull this, this would be a bad year to do it. It was not a particularly great year. He had great moments during the year, but this was not a great year for him. And now here he is two weeks from the end of the window, pretty much. And Barcelona are giving out half-assed offers. PSG are holding their ground, which they should. And right now he's trapped. He has nowhere to go. There is no move that he can make. The move he can make is leaking to the media and hoping that the environment gets toxic enough around him and the club that PSG have no other choice but to sell him. And as we'll talk about later, the the PSG ultras kind of stupidly played into that when I think they should have just saved it for September and let him hear it then or wait till he came back as a member of Barcelona to let him hear it. (laughs) But this is why this is such a mess because PSG, and this is where we get to the next part. And I I want to to, to, I don't want to keep blabbling on, but Ed, yeah, this is I think the key question here. Does PSG have to sell them? I don't think they have to do anything. I mean, if they do keep him, it's going to be toxic, but winning cures everything. If he comes on the pitch and blocks out all the noise and is able to to score and assist and and lead. You know, he'll be suspended for the first three games, I think. But if he's able to come back and lead PSG to a deep Champions League run, the ultras are going to come back to him. I'll come back to him. I'll probably tell him, I'm sorry, call him a scumbag. So winning cures all. However, if he remains on the team and is, you know, disinterested, it's going to be bad. And you can't, I kind of joked on this on, about this on Twitter. You can't send him to the reserves. We don't even have reserves, but. It will be a really bad situation, and I don't know if that's a game that PSG can really play, um, keeping him. And if he doesn't perform, you're kind of just throwing away the season. So they're they're standing strong. I think they're they're fair in asking for Coutinho, Semedo, and 120 million. Maybe they can come down a little bit from that number, but I think PSG need to have the two players that they want, not some throwaway players like Rakitic. Um, and, and, you know, it, maybe they can take 80 million, 80 million and get the player that they want. I think I think they do need to sell. I think that it it's run its course. Neymar would have been smart, like you said, to run out this season, come back from injury. And if he and if he did and he played well, then PSG would have been happy because then they could have let him go and get more money for him. And Neymar would have been happy because the transfer would have been much easier. He would have proven himself after two injuries. It would have been a much better situation, but Neymar's not smart enough. His people aren't smart enough to understand the big picture. And he's still relatively young. One more season's not going to, but maybe they're playing it where if he, what if he does get injured again? So then he's stuck in Paris, you know, till whatever, 2023, whatever his contract's up. So there's a lot on both sides that you have to think about. Um, so what do you think? Do you, do you think that, that, well, that he, they need to sell Neymar? Let me ask you a question. Yeah. You, you listen to the, 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 the press. You, you uh, read and listened to the press conferences after the game yeah. against me. Did the players turn against him? No, I, I think Verratti even players, said that he wants them. Yeah. Did Tomas Tuchel turn against him? No, he's like, he's my player. You know, I, I coach him. We don't talk about anything. He's kind of, you know, straight down the as line. Leonardo, as Leonardo really turned against Neymar here, as he has said anything despairing about Neymar at all. Not not publicly, but I believe there was a report that he kind of undressed Neymar or something like that or told yeah, him the way okay, it's going to be. A report, and we yeah. don't know exactly what that is. Exactly, yeah, all. publicly he's not said anything disparaging. Oh, okay. So, our PSG... I mean, I'm, I'm, these are not rhetorical. You can answer them. <laughs> are PSG going to make a multi-million dollar decision based on a hundred people in one end of their stadium and a hundred people on Twitter? Should they make the decision based on that? Because let's weigh the evidence. Mm-hmm. The players don't seem to mind them. The players actually want them to stay. 
I think he has a good relationship with most of those players. I don't think his relationship with the players has been the issue here. I think in the overall, there's been an issue of a cultural, there's been a cultural thing that's Mm -hmm. kind of been a barrier to Neymar acclimating, but I don't think that means that he hates all the players he's around. I think he likes those guys. So there's no issue really in the locker room. There's nothing personal going on there. He hasn't said anything publicly. Now he could have, he could have done this in three ways. Two of them are bad. One of them are good. He could have he could have done what I wanted him to do, which is say, "Hey, I had I played here for two years. I've had good moments. I've had some bad moments, but I feel like for my career that I want to move on and go somewhere else. If PSG can get a deal to get me moved, then that's great. If they can't, if the deal is not sufficient, I'll come back and I'll play hard for them, mm-hmm. and we'll we'll try again next year. What well, else? There's that thing. There's that thing. Uh, the article by uh, our friend Julian Laurence, where he said at the the last graph was that if he were to come back, Barcelona wants some sort of public gesture, likely on social media, from Neymar to prove his commitment to the potential move. Should PSG, uh, if he's not moved, require the same thing from him? You know, some kind yeah, of. That's that's another hypothetical that I'm not sure. Yeah. About just, uh, uh, just I wanted to get to those other two options, sure. but just okay. Well, here's another option. That is the option that you just put. That's the op. That's the second option where he says, "I don't want to be here. I want to go to Barcelona." You know, and he, he does it in a forceful kind of arrogant, snotty way to force PSG's hand. You can do that, which I don't think would be good either, because I think what that would do is it would dig PSG's. I think if he did that. I think PSG would dig in even more. And in fact, I probably think they'd sell him to Real Madrid just to just to not sell him to Barcelona. I think he knows that. Yeah. I think he knows that if he did that, PSG would dig its heels in even more. And there'd be no chance of him going to Barcelona. Now, the third option is what he went with, which was say nothing and manipulate behind the scenes. Which... Is a terrible strategy in this case because it has allowed the media to take this in 9,000 different ways and has painted Neymar in a way that has soured his relationship with the PSG fan base, which is kind of what he wanted, I think, if he wanted to really make this move and really was committed to it, which it seems like he is. But it's not the most noble way to do it. And it's not the most honorable way to do it as well. Now, I don't think PSG sh- should make him apologize in, in the, in that any apology would come off as phony and fake. And it would only, it wouldn't help the relationship with the fans and it would just be, it'd just be humiliating for no reason. And I'm, I don't think, we should be in the business as, as fans and as commentators. Maybe we would like to see him be humiliated, but I don't think that's good to do that. <clears throat> and I would rather him just come back, play the games, keep his mouth shut and play hard. And eventually people would come around. I think. I mean, PSG are really doing him a favor by even, having Barcelona executives over to talk about a potential deal. We all know that these two clubs are like oil and water. They don't get along. PSG do not want to sell him, but they understand that they're one of the few teams that could maybe afford him or maybe have the assets to get a deal done. But let's just be real. They don't want to sell. So they're already doing Neymar a favor. Um, So hopefully Neymar respects that and doesn't come out and say anything on social media too disparaging or you no, know. it would it would it would backfire. Yeah, he just it would absolutely backfire if he did that. Absolutely, it's it's a difficult situation. If he stayed, like I like I said earlier, I think that if he performs well and and the team is winning and they're playing great, which when he's healthy, he's fully capable of being the engine behind the offense. Um, I think the ultras will come around. They'll be singing his name, winning no, cures all. I don't think he'll go that far. Okay, I think he's lost that. I think he's lost that privilege. Very few players actually have that privilege. I don't even think they sing. Like, they don't sing like every player's name. Like they only sing the players that are really there and like really up there with that. I don't think he gets that. 
But I think if he if he comes back for this year, and I think he would only be for one year if he comes back. I think it would be oh. one year, and then they would sell him in, in June the following 100%, year. 100%, yeah, definitely. But – and I think that's probably the best option for everybody involved, to be, to be honest. I, I really do. I think that's what they sh- – that's what I'd be suggesting, which is, hey, you know, well, just make that deal with them and just say, hey, look, this is, you know, th- this isn't going to work. We, you know, even if we want to sell you and we maybe do, maybe don't, mm-hmm. there isn't that there just isn't a good it's not a it's not the market isn't right for what PSG want from him. If, from if he if him. he were if he were to stay. His future literally hangs on his flimsy ankles. If he goes down with another injury, that's it. That's it for PSG selling him for any kind of substantial amount of money, like what we're talking about, what they want with Coutinho and Smedo and 120. I mean, that that's terrifying. His his career, three injuries in three seasons on his ankles, and it doesn't seem like he's wanting to wear a different kind of boot or do any sort of special treatment on that. So he's got these flimsy angles that can just roll over and, and snap like a twig. And so all of this hinges on that. That's why I'm like, it's good to dig in and stand strong if you're PSG and try to get the best deal. But as that you know transfer window deadline starts approaching, they may just need to cut a deal and say, you know what? Something's better than nothing because if he goes no, down, no, we're screwed. You know what? I'd rather him get the injury because at that point, P- PSG are not um, – this is not – we're not Borussia Dortmund. We're not, you know, we're not Ajax. We're not, we're not a club that needs the money that badly. We really don't. We can, we pretty much dealt with most of the financial fair play problems. We're kind of fine with that. It's not a real issue. Mostly thanks to Neymar and the sponsorship yeah, deals. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? And thank him for that. And Neymar's, Neymar really did change, I think, the financial direction of the club. So it's not like he's been a total bust. There's been a huge financial windfall because he came and more importantly, because he brought Kylian Mbappe with him. So let's not forget that. But here's the thing. You can't, you cannot sell him for, you know, for a deal that is not advantageous to you. Like it's, it's, it's just, you don't cut bait on a, on an asset like that. If that's not how asset management works in the business world, you don't cut bait and sell something for less than its value or way less than it. We're talking way less than its value. We're talking, here's what I mean. It, it, let's say PSG value Neymar or what they bought him, which is 222 million euros. That's their valuation for him. Now, what they would be doing is saying, hey, we're going to take less than half of that in liquidity, in liquid assets, in money. We're taking less than half of his worth in, a, in liquid money assets. And we're also taking on two other assets that are depreciating in value. Philippe Coutinho is depreciating in value. Ivan Rakitic is depreciating in value. Why, for a player that we value at 222 million euros, are we giving that up, that liquidity up for 40% of it and two assets that you cannot sell for what Barcelona are valuing them as? That's bad business in any circumstance. It's bad business. I, he, he's, he is valued, but I, I will say that his value has fallen off pretty steep. So value, he's played but value to who? To anybody. He's well, only played in 51.8% of matches since joining PSG. Yeah, but that's, that's again, it's value to you. And I'm not saying you're going to get 222 million euros. What I'm saying is you're taking less than half of that. Like, you, if you, don't, like, you can't take less than half. It's kind of like when you buy a new car. You buy a new car, from, you know, and as soon as you drive it off the lot, it's 25% less. It's not worth anything. I mean, it's worth something, but it, you know, when you drive a car off the lot, so PSG have driven the Neymar car off the lot and now it is dropped in value 90 million. 
And that's just the, and with the injuries, it's like being in a car accident. Oh, You're trying to sell a car that's been in two car accidents. That's what people say the value is dropped at. That's not what the value is. The value has not dropped 90 million. That's what people are saying the value is dropped who don't have an evaluation of the actual player. You're talking about people online or people who are, are you know, trying to put it into some sort of algorithm saying that the value is dropped. The value is not dropped at 100 million euros and two guys that can't play at Barcelona's level. That's that's ridic- That's a ridiculous devaluation. That if is, if it's if, absurdly low. If I just told you, hey, here's a player that has been, you know, played in 51% of his games in the last 3 years. Yes, and in and, those games And his name wasn't Neymar and I didn't tell you the name and I said, "Oh, he's been two season-ending injuries." What would you value a player of this? It's the name Neymar that brings that, you know, skyrockets the value because of his off the the field stuff. It's the statistics too. The guy when he's played has been by far the best player on the team. He just is there that much. Player in the league that he's playing in. That's statistic. Again, if we look statistically and then divide it by the amount of games played, he's probably around a goal a game. There was a statistic where when Neymar scores a goal, PSG won ninety five percent to ninety percent, ninety to ninety nine. Was it ninety to ninety five percent of their matches when the guy scored a goal? Like, the PSG don't need help winning league on. They've done that the past seven years, whatever. Yeah, and look at the Champions League. And he's not there when we need him. The best ability is availability. He's not there. They lost one. How many games did they lose with him playing in the Champions League? Three, I think. It was, yeah, it was three. Yeah. They lost a game to Bayern Munich that didn't really matter at the end of the, the 17, uh, when, uh, 17 group stage. They lost a game to Liverpool this year's group stage, and then they lost that game to Madrid. So, again, you just look at it statistically, and we've done this before. And I'm not, you know, we when we when we liked the guy, we would we would bring out these statistics, and we would say when this guy plays, he is by far the best player on the field and one of the top five players in the world. Now, the problem is he's had two injuries. Now, can you look ahead and go that guy's going to get injured again? Maybe. But that's not a sure bet either. You're looking at a 50-50 proposition. He goes back to Barcelona. He plays in a league that's less physical. He scores 30 goals for Barcelona. And now all of a sudden, PSG look like idiots. So, and Not if we get Coutinho and Semedo in $120 million. But we're not getting Nelson Semedo. That was it's been pretty clear we're not getting Nelson Semedo. Barcelona, I think if Barcelona wants Neymar, they're going to have to give him up. Exactly. You see where the impasse is? That's where the impasse is. They don't want to give anything up that of actual value. Yeah. So they're trying to get him for two cast-offs and 40% of his valuation by the club. Now let's say they gave you 150. That's not less than that's not less than half the valuation. That sounds better to me. 150 plus Coutinho, that works for me. 140 plus Coutinho, maybe we'd start talking. But if you're going to do that deal, if you're going to do that deal, it needs to be done like yesterday because we need to reinvest that money and bring in perhaps a goalkeeper, perhaps a right back. You know, we got to reinvest for the season. Theoretically, you could use that money in January if you needed to. It's always tough to do a deal then. But, yeah, sure, you could do that. You could do that. But you, you, you know what I'm saying? And I, I'm glad we're having this argument because it's like that is the the key here. They don't want him bad enough to give PSG a package worth PSG's time. And why doesn't Leonardo do this? this is what I've always wondered. You have until Sunday. These are our demands. You need to give us your best and final by Sunday, or we're moving on. Just set an ultimatum. I don't know that he, ha- know that he hasn't done that. I- I'm tired of like bickering back and forth and bartering with Barcelona. Like this is what it costs. There's if much you bartering going on, Barcelona have yet to actually give them a serious offer. Well, then I'm, I'm, I'm upset that they wasted the, the fuel to fly there when they knew the deal and they weren't going to match it. Like yes. you know, global warming is a thing. Stop flying unnecessarily. Yes, that's exactly what happened because they're not serious. And that's the, the, the thing here. Barcelona are not serious here. They're not putting out good faith offers. 
if they gave you a good faith offer, we could have the conversation. Until you give us a good faith offer, PSG are not going to be taken advantage of here. Leonardo is not stupid enough to be taken advantage of here. And Neymar is not going to boycott. He's not going to throw hissy fits. He's going to play because he has to play. Because he can't sit out a whole year. He can't, you know, have mysterious injuries. He can't do that. Like, that's not what a professional football player does. That's what no professional football player does that. I've never heard of really one or maybe a handful that have ever done that. So he's going to play and he's going to play hard and he's going to try. So if I'm PSG, I'm looking at it going, the locker room doesn't have a problem with them. The coach clearly doesn't have a problem with them. You know, besides this nonsense, we don't have a problem with them. But clearly he has a problem with us and wants to leave. So if you come up to a reasonable level and give us a serious offer, we'll consider it and we'll probably end up selling him. Because who wants the pain in the ass around anyway? I don't want him around if he's going to be a pain in the ass. But we, you have to, you can't look at this emotionally. It has to be a business. You yeah. have to look at it like a business. This is not, you know, you do things on a whim. This is you do things with purpose. And if PSG are going to cash in one of their, you know, best ships and cash out at the casino, they better have a good, they better be in a good spot to do so. Yeah. Last thing I'll, I'll say on on the issue is that if this were in FIFA and, you know, the video game and, and Barcelona tried to pull this deal off, you know, they would do like the, the head shaking. I don't know if you play FIFA, but the hands would be flailing and you wouldn't be able to contact the team for like two weeks. So those who play FIFA will know what I'm talking about. It's, it's an absurd offer and they're not doing it in good faith. That's why Leonardo needs to say Sunday best and final or, you know, go kick rocks. I wouldn't deal with it anymore. I wouldn't have this ongoing. I'll say Barcelona is now out. I would make a public comment. Barcelona is now out. They did not, you know, come with that to us with a good offer and we're not maybe next season. We'll try it again. Um, we'll have more. We have a couple questions about Neymar. We'll, we'll tackle at the very end of the podcast, but let, let's just switch gears a little bit. I've got between the, all the Neymar talk here that we just did and all the Neymar stands on Twitter. I'm kind of like Neymar out, to be honest with you. Um, let's talk about some real football. Mark, we had a, um, our Liga opener against Nîmes at the Parc des Princes. It was a three nil win. We had Edinson Cavani. He won a penalty in the 24th minute. Actually, he didn't win it. It was a kind of a dodgy penalty awarded after VIR. Uh, then we had Kylian Mbappe scored in the second half, and then Di Maria tacked on another. So the three nil win. It was great. We got three points. I was looking at the table. I don't think. I actually think that Leon is is ahead of us. For I have no idea why. I mean, it's, it's just high. alphabetical. It's, they're alphabetically ahead of us. Okay. Yeah, alphabetically ahead of us. So. Take that for what you will, but what stood out to you in that match other than the ultras and all the exterior stuff? Yeah, we'll get to that. I have a I have an issue with uh, I don't say an issue. I have concerns with the ability of Kylian Mbappe and Edison Cavani to play together without Neymar to sort of orchestrate things. Sorry to bring them up again, but it, it, okay. it all, it all plays into it. Um, the first half of, to just go back a little bit, the first half of the uh, Ren Trophy des Champions game, I thought was really bad. I didn't think they played well at all. Mm-hmm. I thought the whole thing, I thought they, they, it was a mess. They were not, they, defensively, they weren't set where they needed to be, and I thought that they offensively didn't have a great plan. Second half, they got better. They ended up winning. This game, I thought, was better. I thought, I thought that even without Ander Herrera, who's out for about a little less than a month with a with a, I think a calf injury. Yeah, happy birthday to <laughs> by the way, yes. Andrew. I think today's his birthday. Yeah, so, he's a big listener. He's a big fan of the 1970s. Reached out. We're gonna hopefully have him on the show soon. He's listened to all three of our shows. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that they're going to have to figure out how to get Killian Mbappe more involved in what they're doing because it's clear, I think, that as long as Marco Verratti is healthy, he is the engine of the offense now. 
he's the guy that makes it all tick. He's going to be the primary ball handler. He's going to be the primary playmaker. He's going to be the guy in the middle of the field. They're going to play him more advanced. They're going to play Marquinhos or Gouillet behind him. And Verratti's going to be the – he's going to be what Luka Modric was to Real Madrid, what um, Iniesta was to Barcelona. That's the idea. And I think now that they actually have midfielders and they can re-sort of deploy Verratti and Verratti doesn't have to be as defensive as he's been the last couple of years – where he's had to, you know, cover for the fact that PSG don't have midfielders. Now that they do, he can he can go ahead. And I think that's what we saw in that, especially in that game against Nîmes. I thought Marco Verratti was just the the guy. I mean, now, that tackle that he had that set up Mbappe's goal was it? No, it was the tackle that set up the pass to Mbappe, who then passed it to Di Maria. Di Maria. Okay, that's what it was. But yeah, if you haven't seen it, go watch that GIF or video. Incredible tackle. And then immediately got it over to Mbappe and sprung the attack. Incredible. And that's and that's what's going to happen. Now, the key here, and what I think we have to figure out is, where does Kylian Mbappe fit into all of this? How is he going to be most effectively used? I think he right now is playing, trying to play the Ronaldo role of starting on the left wing and working his way to the middle as the match goes. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, you feel your way into the game, he starts on the left and then eventually you start seeing him pop up in the middle and the center. And then he starts popping up in the box. And I think you're going to see some of that. And once, and I thought in the second half, you saw a lot of that and that's how he got his goal. He got his. That was a very Ronaldo-like goal in the in the in that second half. Like, yeah. it was a perfectly weighted pass from Martinez. Juan Bernat playing the role of Marcelo puts it down, passes it into the center, and then Mbappe playing the role of Ronaldo just buries it. That was that was a very Real Madrid goal, and that's kind of when you look at that. That's how PSG are going to have to play without Neymar. They're going to have to put pressure on you. Win the ball, can possess the ball more. Like their possession is going to have to be in the high 60s, low 60s in Champions League games. They're going to have to control the ball with their midfield. And then they're going to have to pick out passes out wide. And they're going to have to let Cavani and Mbappe sort of sniff goals in the box. And Cavani's going to have to be more active. He doesn't look like Cavani right now. He looks like a guy that's kind of Edinson Cavani, but he picks his spots. Like, he's not as active offensively as he's been in the past. Yeah, he's not making those patented runs in the box where he was always just knew where to be. He's not really doing that, and he's he's still good for at least one or two. Just how did he miss that moment? Yeah, but like to me, it's like he's – Cavani's going to have to figure out how to be a little more active, but I think they're sort of figuring this out. And when Herrera comes back, they'll have more depth. But I've liked what I've seen. Marquinhos is, oof, like they've got, they have, to me, three world-class players on the field. Marquinhos, how, much is Marquinhos, how much is Marquinhos worth after, after we just saw Harry Maguire? I think I joked about that on Twitter, but, I mean, is he 100 mil? I mean, what could you get oh, yeah, for him right I would, now? I, first of all, I would never sell him, but uh, no. he's clearly a hundred million euro player. Like that guy is a center back. He can play defensive mid. He is right now, as I said, PSG have three world class players on the field: Marquinhos, Verratti, and Mbappe, and they make up the spine of the team. You forgot Juan Bernat. Yeah, Juan Bernat. But you know, in all seriousness, Juan Bernat's been a tremendous. I love him. He, oh, he's tremendous. Like he, again, he doesn't do too. He doesn't do all that much, but what he does is good. And then he'll make those plays for you. Like, I mean, right now they do have a good team. They have a very solid team right now. And if you were to sell Neymar well, and sell him for a good price, you'd probably be able to get an even better team. And you could fill you could fill in some key pieces here and there. And. Yeah, I'll let you say, well, what did you see? Because I, I saw, I see the spine of a really good team with great kind of role players around it. 
I still think there's some weak links, but they have a they got a solid team here if they can build it right and are coached right. Yeah, I'm still. I, well, I thought the the game was great. Obviously, three 0 You can't complain about that. I, I wasn't sold on Mbappe and Cavani, but then the more I think about it, I like the idea of Cavani out there just because it keeps the defenders honest. It, it makes them pay attention to him because he can. He is lethal. He will score on you, and it gives Mbappe just that little bit of extra room where Verratti or maybe even Sarabia can pick him out in space, and and Mbappe can what just use his name? pace. Sarabia? Did I say it wrong? Okay. I- I thought you said oh. something else. No, you're fading in and out on us, uh, but I'll keep it going. So I, I, right, any I'm of the right. midfielders, when Herrera uh, comes back, any of them can pick out a pass from Mbappe and he can use his pace. So I think it's a it's a work in progress when Neymar, if he does eventually come back, I think that it makes the team even better. But I agree with what you said. I think the money from the Neymar sale could be used in a really good way. Areola didn't make you know terrible mistakes in this game, but I still don't trust him. I know a lot of people disagree. I don't trust them in the big game. I think some of that money could be spent on a, a, a world-class goalkeeper. I still think we need a right back. We had Kerr starting starting in uh, the right back position. I don't love that move. Um, I think we need to upgrade at that position as well. well the, I think what's happening is they have three right backs right now. You have Kerr, Munier, and Dagba. I think you, you Paul PSG fans, I think they'd rather see Dagba play there, but I still think he's young, and I still think – he needs to get acclimated into that. I don't think you could just give it to him right away. You I know mean, Liver- to- Liverpool did that with, uh, was it Trent Arnold Alexander? Is that his name? Trent Alexander Arnold. Uh, I had it backwards. Yeah, they did it with him. I remember making a joke like he's not going to, I don't know what it was. They were playing Barcelona, and he actually did really well. So uh, there's something to be said for giving these young kids an opportunity in, in big on the big stage. Yeah. So, yeah, I look forward to what's coming ahead. I think they, I think they, and, I mean, quite honestly, they could really do some damage if they can make this team work. And I, I see the I see the potential for this to work. Now, we got more topics, don't we? We do. Yeah. So in this game, we'll just go through this briefly. The ultras um, held up some banners. I'm not fluent in French, but from the translation, not great things were said towards Neymar, our uh, correspondent, Lee Davy, uh, was in the stands, recorded some of it, uh, the chanting, some of the banners. He said he didn't love it. You can kind of understand where they're coming from. But like you said, it, it doesn't set up good if Neymar were to come back. Um, I'm, you know me, I'm always thinking about the kids. I didn't like that kind of chanting and, and banners, you know. Parc du Prince is a family friendly venue. Well, um, it, 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 it's now a fa- it was not a family friendly venue for a very long time. Yeah. So you never you never like to see that, but um it I'll, makes things difficult if Neymar were to come back. I don't even think it's that because again, it's a hundred fans. It's not it's not the whole fan it's not the whole fan base. It's it's that group. And honestly, I don't mind the chance, because I think he kind of deserved the chance. I don't mind the Neymar Cassetois. Sign. I don't mind that at all. Then there was the, the the black and white banners that they unfurled. That I'll just say it. We, it was a joke about the fact that he brought a girl over from uh, from Brazil, uh, and that girl woman um, eventually accused him of, of sexual assault, rape, and very recently Neymar was cleared of that charge, and the prosecutors did not bring the charge against him. So I don't think you make light of sexual assault and rape and all that. I just, I don't think that's a a way to go. I think that's a low blow. I think that's a, that's unnecessary. I think there's a lot of things you can rag on Neymar for. I think, you know, the fact that he was put in incredible legal jeopardy and technically we don't a hundred percent know if he did it or didn't, but, Legally, clearly, there was not enough evidence to prove either way. So, you know, they weren't going to charge him on a case that they couldn't convict them on. So I don't like that being brought up. I just think it's wrong to bring that up. I think it's beneath what we should be doing as fans. So, you know, whatever. But I don't think that's going to make I don't think that's a negative either way. Honestly, I think. There's too much money at stake to like do a deal based on what people with banners say. So 
it's more uncouth than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I don't have really anything else to add to that. It just makes things difficult, like I said. Um, when he, if he does come back, you know, winning back over the ultras and performing for fans that said that kind of stuff. I agree. You know, sexual assault. You never want to joke about that, even if he was, even if charges were dropped or whatever. You know, just leave that kind of stuff out of it. And uh, yeah, not not good. And I, I did say before the game that the ultras probably would have some strongly worded banners and or TIFOs and I was proven right there. So we'll see for the next game and see what happens there. Uh, let's keep it moving. Um, so was it the other day, maybe two days ago, PSG celebrated their 49th birthday. So Mark, I want you to give me your top 49 players in PSG history. No, I'm kidding. Um, just real quick. Where do you think the club's going to be in the next 49 years? Well, the show's been long enough, but um, we actually just I, passed the 49th minute. I think that you just have to put things in perspective. Just put it in perspective how old PSG is compared to the other clubs in Europe. And then compare where PSG is now to where those clubs are. And you look at it and you go, PSG have had one of the most rapid growths in the history of world football. 49 years, they've won 40 trophies. 49 years, their valuation is near a billion dollars or a billion euros. This is a major, major kind of growth to, you know, from a club that was basically an amalgamation of a club that already existed in Paris. Yeah. Yeah with a group of investors that wanted to create some sort of super club in Paris to now they're a global brand. They're being worn by Michael Jordan, by Rihanna, by, you know, numerous amounts of celebrities, Justin Timberlake, you know, just marvel at where PSG are in their first 49 years compared to where all these other clubs are. And, to be where, and let's put it this way, to where all the other clubs were 49 years into their history. Now, to be fair, that the way world football has been marketed over the last 20 years has allowed this to happen. Global football has blown up in popularity and in money, and the money's poured in, and it's allowed PSG to be able to do this. But still, one of the most rapid growths in the history of maybe even all of sports. Like I, I can compare them to maybe the Dallas Cowboys who basically became a cultural worldwide phenomenon in 20 years. The Yankees took about 35, 40 years to really be, even though they were winning world series in the twenties and thirties, the base pretty much 25, 30 years. It took the Yankees to be a world, you know, a pretty much a, a global thing, or at least, you know, it was the twenties and thirties. So a national thing, but you get the point. Yeah, like the the PSG are up there with those clubs and their ability to just grow at this at this rate. So I'm sure we'll have some really cool stuff for the 50th anniversary next year. But just well, I guess we'll just say happy 49th birthday. They're not quite over the hill yet. So, <laughs> yeah, hopefully next season they have a special like 50 year anniversary kit. I saw Ange had this really cool like I think it's their 100th anniversary or something like that. And they've got a really cool retro kit that you can order and it comes in a special box. Uh, so hopefully something like that. But yeah, in the next 49 years, I actually think PSG's esports team is going to rival the the club in terms of popularity. If, if anyone follows esports, I think that's just going to keep blowing up and credit to PSG for being, you know, on that level along with their women's team and their handball team. I mean, they're everywhere, but yeah, I would just echo everything you said, incredible growth. And it's not all about just money. There's a lot of teams out there, Manchester United who have a lot of money and don't know what to do and aren't nearly the global brand, you know, that, that PSG are, and, and they're going to continue to grow. Um, so, and, and people say, well, 40 trophies or whatever, you can only play the teams on the schedule. Paris is in France. They're in the French league. They have to play who they play. It's not their fault that the other teams haven't raised their game. There's other teams. I just mentioned Ange, who have been around a lot longer, you know, and they've made a lot of money. It's up to them to reinvest and try to compete with PSG. So you shouldn't really blame them for, you know, beating up on the teams in their league. 
that's just the way things are. So looking forward to the rest of this year, the 49th, and then 50 should be fun. Let's wrap up our five uh, quick topics. Let's just go around the horn and, and league on. Um, Looking at the table, we mentioned Leon just on alphabetical order is number one. PSG two, Angers three, Stad Rim is fourth. Uh, Monaco is way down there in the relegation zone along with Nîmes and our good friends Marseille. So, Mark, just real quick, anything stand out to you in the first round of games? Um, I think Leon have done a good job. Unlike Monaco did a couple years ago, I think they've done a good job in reinvesting in what you know in in good players i think leon are going to be the number two team i think if they can you know if they can not be inconsistent they should challenge psg i think they should get within 10 points i don't think there's any reason leon should yeah. not be within 10 points of psg by the end of this thing i would say third place i i think monaco is better than they were last year i think they'll figure it out if they if not, they're gonna have to fire their coach again. <laughs> but I think Leon a clear two, Monaco, Saint Etienne, I think are in that three four range, and I would put Marseille down at fifth. I don't think they've done a good job at all investing their money. I think they've they're they're kind of broke. Like <laughs> it, they, they're not investing the way that they were supposed to invest, and I don't see Marseille doing anything this year so uh, those are my tiers do you see anything differently than i do yeah i mean i would agree with a lot of that there's one team that people really just don't they're not very high on and when i look at their roster i'm like they should be a lot better i really like nice i think they've got a a decent manager um in patrick Vieira, and i think this season he's going to want to get the results he's going to get uh nice into at least a battle for a spot in Europe next season. Cause I think he has, you know, one eye on that job, uh, Arsenal, which is currently held by our friend Unai Emery. I think he has dreams of hopefully going back to North London. Um, but you just look, you know, Yusuf, at uh, all. I think he is a great player. Um, Waylon Cyprian. I think he's great. Um, I like Malang Sar. I think they've got some really good young pieces there with the manager who is motivated to get the best out of his team. I've always really liked Nice and I never really understood why they just haven't really put it together. Um, you know, they're, they've, they won on opening day. So, but hopefully they'll carry it on. So I would keep an eye on them. Leal, I really like, uh, them as well. I think keeping an eye on, uh, Tim Weah. um, curious to see how he does with a little bit more playing time. And I've always liked Strasbourg. I think they've got great home support. I think they've got, you know, Kenny Lala. I think he's a, a great defender. I would love to see him at right back for uh, PSG. So keep an eye on them as well. Um, so that's our quick around the horn on, on Liga. We'll, we'll definitely check in from time to time and give our thoughts on the Liga as a whole. We're not all PSG centric here. But, Mark, let's go ahead. We're, we're a little over time here. Let's, let's uh, go through some quick questions. You ready here? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So. At PSG Fan TV, he wants to know what offers from Barca and Madrid would you accept for Neymar if you were Leonardo? Kind of uh, talked about that already a little we bit. We did talk about that already, and I have blocked this person before. So, <laughs> so we, um, but, I'm not sure if I should. You know what? I'll answer it. I'll give. I'll okay. throw a book out there. Um, I'll just. I'll lay it out simply. It has to be more than half of his valuation. So if PSG value him at 222. Divide that. I would say I'd rather it be around 70% of his valuation, but I'll go as low as 60. So if we're doing if we're doing really quick math here, I'm going to pull out the calculator. So two, let's say what would be 50% of 222 divided by five me. by two is 111. Uh, divided by four would be about 55 times three. So anything around 166 million is 75 percent. So between 50 percent and 75 percent, if you hit around the middle, that's about 130 ish. So I would probably take about 130, which means you can use that money to buy two key players as opposed to one. And then you give me. Philippe Coutinho, even though I don't know if he'll start for PSG, to be yeah. quite honest. I think he could do something with Coutinho, maybe. He had a good Copa America 
I mean, Maybe. Neymar didn't because, you know, he's injured, so. Yeah, well, so something around those lines. I would say I don't know player-wise what I'd take, but it would at least have to be 130 plus a player or maybe two. I like a deal with Real Madrid. Number one, because Neymar doesn't want to go there. I like going to Real Madrid because we could maybe get uh, Kaylor Navas from Real Madrid, potentially. Um, I also, I wonder if they would part ways with Varane. Maybe. Um, they've got some good pieces. I think I read something that said, uh, I'm going to butcher his name, but Vinicius Jr. Did I get they, that right? They don't want to sell us Vinicius. Yeah. Well, he, he would, to me, he would be the, the player I'd ask for. Cause he, yeah. could, uh, he could, he could hug the left side and he could, he could, he could free up Mbappe. I would take him. Could you do him and maybe James or him and, and no, Rakic, I don't or, um, do with James. We, have enough, we have enough players that do what James does. We don't yeah. need don't need James. I'd want, but yeah, if you, if yeah, Navas yeah, and yeah. 130 in Navas. I like the pieces at Real Madrid a little bit more. And plus, I don't want to deal with Barcelona, and I would love to sell Neymar to their rivals and piss them off a little bit more. So, yeah. there you go at PSG Fan TV. That's who we go with. Uh, let's see any non Neymar questions. This one's kind of, but I kind of like it. So this is from at D7 Eisenman. Do you think the media is going to portray PSG as getting the bad end of the deal, regardless of the structure of the deal? Now we always yes. talked about the way the yes. media covers. Do so you think? Yes. yes. Yeah. Next question. Yes. Yes. I would agree with that. Yes. Anything that they can just crap on PSG, they will do it. Um, here we go. This is from at X Roger 78. He wants to know, how do you feel now about Di Maria? Can he be consistent this year? And how much more should we give Draxler? your best friend to prove himself. Uh, we'll take Di Maria first. Di Maria okay. is not consistent. That's not what he does. Di Maria is a flash player, meaning he has moments where a lot of the game where he's just sort of not all that great, but then he'll have like three or four really masterful moments that make it worth him being on the field. And he's going to play in critical matches, whether it be off the bench or starting. He probably, him and Sarabia are probably going to be, one will start and one will come in and replace the other. They'll, they're going to rotate the whole year. And Di Maria is one of the best free kick takers in Europe. So I don't need him to be great all the time. I just need him to have those moments. Uh, Draxler, it's, I don't I want to get into it too much because I could go forever on him. I, I love him as a player. I wish he'd be more aggressive because I don't think he even really realizes how talented and gifted he is. But without Neymar... He is the smartest player PSG has. He's actually, Verratti, I would say, is smart in a different way. He's more instinctual. Draxler is like a computer. He's like a, it's like a video game out there. He's a computer. He understands where people are going to be. He can't always make the play, but he knows the play to make. He's like a Volkswagen. So, he's, he's just de- dependable. You know? yes, he just, I own a Volkswagen, ironically. I do too, yeah. Shout out German engineering. Yes. Um, There's a reason I, Tuchel plays him. It's because Draxler is intelligent and he understands how to where to be and what to do. He doesn't always flash at you, but the guy is a reliable, rock solid player. Agreed. Well, although one of the best tweets I saw recently during a match, I think it was probably against Neem. Someone said, what is actually the point of Julian Draxler? <laughs> I kind of like that one. I don't know why it made me laugh. I uh, agree with you about Di Maria. Just super inconsistent, but I love him as a super sub. I am, as you are the president of the, the Draxler fan club, I am president of the Sarabia fan club. So the more playing time he can see and keeping Di Maria on the bench and, and limited to maybe 20 to 30 minute appearances, I think that is the way PSG should go. I think that's their winning. No, but you're going to want to play Di Maria over Sarabia in Champions League matches and big matches. It's just, you, you can't, you can't leave your best free kick taker off the field because you don't get as many in the Champions League. You don't get as many opportunities on goal. So when you get free kicks outside the box, you really need a guy that can score. them. So it's going to be really hard to keep Di Maria off the field in champion in big Champions League matches. I'm just telling you now. Yeah. Sarabi didn't have a good opening game. So yeah. he. No, he Sarabi is fine. He'll play a lot. It's just yeah. he as good as Di Maria at that skill. And who would you rather take that free kick? I'd rather be Maria take it. Yeah, that's it's a good point. Neymar's, qu- Neymar's yeah. not there. They don't yeah. have a free kick taker of they that really quality don't. except for yeah. Maria. Cavani maybe, but not not great. Yeah, but, yeah, but he, he, 
he had that one against Marseille, but he's not a great free kick taker anyway. He's not awesome at it. He's okay. Yeah. Mbappe's yeah. never really done it before, so he'd really be the guy to do it. That's a great point. You, you persuaded me. Yeah. We're going to – our last question here, Mark. <clears throat> We're going to finish – we started with Neymar. We're going to end with Neymar. So at Flor de Culo – Wants to know, was the Neymar signing worth it, knowing what you know now? Did the Accor uh, Live Limitless checks clear? Uh, Leonardo just called in. He said, yes, they did clear. Yes, we're good. And did Jordan Brand checks clear? That, yes, I do know that. And did the Nike reevaluation checks? Are they, are they all good? Is that paperwork all signed? It is raining euros in the PSG offices. There's your answer. Yeah, hundred oh, percent. Are we, are we it was worth it. Got a, a a really nice fee for him and be able to reinvest in the team. Yeah, yeah. Yep, there you go. Did PSG talk traffic skyrocket when Neymar signed? Yes. yes. <laughs> are you listening to this mostly because you're a Neymar fan or interested in Neymar and you want to know what we have to say about it? Yes. So from our selfish point of view, yes. From the club's financial point of view, yes. When he was on the pitch, the 51% of the times he was on the pitch playing, he was great for us. It was 100% worth it. Anyone who says otherwise is is just – they don't know what they're talking about, and that's why they're not on our podcast. So, yes, I would definitely do it again, and it was worth it. Mark, that's that's the show. That's all we've got. Um, we want to thank you all for listening. Um, you know where to find us. We're actually now – no, maybe you don't know where to find us because we're finally up on all your podcast uh, providers. So we're on iTunes. You can find the 1970. You can find us on Spotify. Find us on Google Play. Apparently, there's something called Google Podcasts, which I don't have a, an Android, so I need to figure that out. And we're also on Stitcher. So hopefully on one of those four, you can find the 1970. Go ahead and search for us. Uh, leave a comment. Review us. Even if it's negative, we'll we'll take it into consideration. So you can find us there. Um Visit the site, psgtalk.com. If you haven't been, we're publishing more and more content. We've got a lot of new um, contributors. Uh, I mentioned Lee Davies. He's doing um, these on-the-road pieces for us on YouTube, and I'm posting them on the site. So just follow us everywhere, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at PSG Talk across the board. You can find us. Um, Mark, do you have anything? How can people find you? Uh, they can find me at Mark Damon one And... Uh... I'll try to write an article at some point for before the Champions League gets underway. I know I haven't done one in a while, but writing about Neymar is depressing, and I, I don't want to. Um, so I'll try to get something up, you know, maybe sort of a Champions League preview of sort eventually. And uh, yeah, just Mark da- at Mark Damon one for Ed. This has been Mark Damon saying good night, Canada, and au revoir for now.